I'm going to um, begin. It's early in the morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Eid Mubarak for those who are celebrating. Um, I expect more to, people to come in, but we have a very distinguished uh, group here with us, um, thought leaders from the Middle East, people working on the Middle East issues. Um, and so the introductions will be very long. So as I introduce each person, we will uh, have more people join us, I'm sure. Um, I'm Leila Halal. I'm the uh, director of the Middle East program at the New America Foundation. And I'm very pleased to be here today. I want to thank uh, Silatec for uh, co-sponsoring and for um, making a big effort to pull this panel together. Um, we have, as I said, a distinguished panel of experts who exemplify the subject of discussion, a socially uh, innovative entrepreneurship in the Middle East. Um, most of the, the, the panelists are, uh, have been linked uh, in different ways, working with each other for some time. So they're very familiar with each other. Um, and allow me now to introduce you to them for those um, perhaps less familiar with their work. Um, to my immediate right is Dr. Tariq Youssef, a leading expert on youth inclusion and policy reform in the Arab world. He is currently CEO of Silatec, a regional Doha-based initiative that promotes job creation, entrepreneurship, access to capital, and the participation of young people in economic and social development. Um, he is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, non-resident senior fellow at the Isam Ferris Institute of the AUB. His prior posts include Dean of the Dubai School of Government, Associate Professor of Economics at Georgetown University, and Senior Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He served as Chair and Vice Chair of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on the Arab World from 2011 uh, to 2000. Uh, you're currently the chair still, okay, uh, which you'll hold through 2014. Dr. Tariq is the uh, author of numerous uh, tens of articles and chapters and uh, co-edited volumes and reports, including Unlocking the Employment Potential in the Middle East and North Africa Toward a New Social Contract, Generation in Waiting, the Unfulfilled Promise of Young People in the Middle East, and After the Spring, Economic Transition in the Arab World. We're pleased to have you with us today, Dr. Tariq. Um, to his right is Dina Sharif, a founding partner of Ahead of the Curve. She is Senior Advisor on Engagement at Silatec and a visiting fellow at the New America Foundation, where she is writing on socially innovative business models in the Middle East. She was Associate Director of the John Garrett Center for Philanthropy and Civic Engagement at the American University in Cairo. Dina sits on the board of numerous regional and national civic engagement organizations in Egypt and Jordan, including the Arab Foundations Forum. She's a leading voice in the MENA region on education, youth engagement, socially responsible business, and strategic philanthropy. She was recently named one of uh, Trust America's top 100 thought leaders on responsible business practice in Europe and the Middle East. To her right is Christopher Schroeder, entrepreneur and venture investor extraordinaire, <laughs> who, uh, Chris, as many of you know, is the author of the recently rele released Startup, Upri Startup Uprising, The Entrepreneurial Revolution Remaking the Middle East, copies of which are in um, the back uh, of the room provided for you. Um, he is, <clears throat> he himself has incubated uh, numerous startup companies, including HealthCentral.com, one of the nation's largest social and content platforms in health and wellness. He was previously CEO of Washington Post. Newsweek, Interactive, and Legislate.com, the B2B interactive platform on U.S. and state legislation and regulation. He currently is an active investor in and advisor to top U.S. venture capital funds and over a dozen consumer-facing social media startups. 
He speaks regularly around the globe and sits on a, a number of board, uh, boards, including the American University of Cairo School of Business, the Jordanian incubator Oasis 500, the Middle East online entrepreneur information platform and network, WAMDA.com, among others. Um, in a former iteration, he held a career in finance and served in uh, President George H.W. Bush's White House and Department of State on the staffs of <clears throat> James Baker III and Robert Zolich. He was named one of LinkedIn top 50 influencers. And finally, uh, we have Fadi Gandor, who is founder and CEO of Aramex International, the preeminent logistics and transportation companies in the Middle East and South Asia, and the first company from the Arab world to go public on the NASDAQ stock exchange. He is a founding partner of Maktoub.com, the world's largest Arab online community, recently acquired by Yahoo. Like uh, his other his colleagues on the panel, he sits on numerous boards of educational and philanthropic institutions across the region. Fadi self-describes as passionate about social entrepreneurship, and in this spirit, uh, one of his greatest uh, feats, I, I think, is the founding of Ruad uh, for Development, an organization most likely familiar to people who follow um, entrepreneurship in the, in the region. Ruad is a regional uh, organization, uh, private sector-led community development uh, effort, which helps to uh, reduce the marginalization of disadvantaged communities through activism, engagement, civic engagement, and education. It is a remarkable organization that I myself have had the opportunity uh, to visit. Um, <clears throat> And it's in uh, the one, uh, the base is in Amman, Jordan. And I should mention that um, the proceeds from Chris's book in the back of the room are all uh, going to Ruad's foundation. So um, without further ado, I will now uh, start the panel discussion. Um, just one quick note, though. Silatec is live tweeting at hashtag Arab Future, and this event is being live streamed. So I want to um, reflect a bit initially on uh, the role of the private sector. Uh, in Washington, we are very deeply engaged with the role of the public sector, uh, this being the seat of uh, the U.S. government, um, and, you know, as thinkers, researchers, uh, actors here, we, we are very well versed in issues of, of public sector um, uh, engagement. And we have us with us today people who are very committed to the private sector, uh, not as uh, solely a place of uh, profiteering, but also as an avenue, an arena through which we can promote uh, uh, development, uh, youth engagement, uh, and address uh, the challenges of the region and of, of the world more broadly. So I want to start with you, uh, Fadi, and, and ask you to uh, sort of tell us your story in terms of how you've really come to merge the worlds of commerce and, and social uh, development. Um, what, what does that nexus uh, look like in your, in your work? Um, thank you, Leila, mm -hmm. and thank you all for coming here. Can you hear me this morning? I, well, I think, you know, instead of, I'll just uh, tell you how I'm looking at it. Please. From, from my perspective and maybe from a private sector perspective of how the private sector should look at it. So the basic premise is that we, uh, we should, uh, and this is an issue that has, that's, that's, that's a global issue. So it's not, you know, our issues in the Arab world are not much different than what you have. Uh, issues of governance, issues of empowerment, issues of youth unemployment, uh, issues of inclusivity, issues of uh, racial divides. I mean, these are global issues, so that we don't think that these are only uh, Arab issues. We, the, we have our issues, 
and we need to address them. And the public-private uh, sector uh, posture and uh, view of how they uh, address the issues of development are also global issues. So uh, we need to put that into perspective in that sense. So the Arab world is not, uh, is not alien to the rest of the world. We're totally connected to it. Uh, and the private sector in the Arab world is not different than the private sector in your part of the world where uh, issues of uh, the well-being of society uh, rather than uh, profit maximization and the business of business being only business and ignoring everything that happens around us in our societies is a global issue. And the way I look at it is that we need to move uh, from that paradigm, uh, the Milton Friedman paradigm that uh, companies' pure uh, raison d'etre is uh, to maximize shareholder value, which is destructive to society. And then when you move from that, you can basically see how the private sector can partner and can take up the responsibility of being part and parcel of how you address critical issues that affect the private sector and affect citizens in general and affects the well-being of the societies that we live in, meaning Meaning, if we address the issue of education, for instance, today, if the private sector is not sitting at the table and, and, and participating structurally, structurally, in how we educate our kids for employment, not for reading only, or not learning a certain language, but for employment, matching what is required in the future, of jobs rather than in the past of jobs. This is the biggest issue today. I mean, in, in, in Spain today, I was reading the other day that youth unemployment is over 30%, just like the rest of the Arab world, and a lot of it is going to be endemic because you need to retrain those people to become in tune with 21st century requirements. And that's how I'm looking at things, uh, Leila. So bringing the private sector to participate and, and education issues and inclusiveness and how you talk about the, uh, the, the Arab youth having uh, and, and requiring to create a mil 100 million jobs in the next, I don't know, depending on what study you, you look at, in the next 10 years, let's say, while maintaining that 25% unemployment that is today, that is today uh, cannot only be the responsibility of the public sector. We should not abdicate uh, our role uh, of, of taking care of our kids and, and the future generations that are coming into the region only to the people in the public sector. Uh, and we have a responsibility and we have to step up and we have a lot of resources in the private sector in terms of networks, in terms of access, in terms of capital, in terms of knowledge, in terms of skills and in terms of jobs. That's the way I'm looking at it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Tarek, can you uh, speak uh, to the issues of sort of the demographics of the region and uh, outlooks in terms of youth uh, thinking and engagement, um, as well as sort of strategies for address m uh, turning the private sector into a, a vehicle for change. Yes. Thank you, Leila, and thanks to everyone for uh, being here this morning, and Eid Mubarak to everyone. Um, I think everyone in the room is familiar with the, the demographics driving a lot of this. I bet you most people in the room are also familiar with a lot of the issues that Fadi touched on, youth unemployment. Uh, so I take it as a, as a point of departure in my comments that everyone is pretty much familiar with the challenges out there as captured very nicely by Fadi. These are not new challenges. Uh, I have grown a bit old following, reading, and writing about these challenges. I would suggest that, in fact, it's been about 15 years since the Arab world has been faced with um, these complex structural uh, and significant challenges affecting youth, unemployment, education, housing, marriage, access to finance. Uh, and so I think that the challenges are fairly well known. 
at this particular moment in time, I think the question, maybe one way of interpreting the, your question, is who is doing <coughs> what about this, and who can do what about it? I'd say two years ago, at the outset of events in the region that toppled a couple of dictatorships and brought about this grassroots movements for change, there was a sense that, in fact, the youth finally will dominate public discourse, public policy, government attention, private sector investments, and that collectively they have managed through uh, their sheer sacrifices across the region to finally make these issues the core of everyone's concern. Um, and while that has been true, we very quickly early on recognize that the short-term dislocation, the short-term dislocation that many of these governments will find themselves in, governments in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Yemen, just to name a few, and by that short-term dislocation, crisis, a crisis management approach. You've got political transition with a lot of economic uncertainty against the backdrop of a global economic recession, shrinking investment flows, limited policy attention on the part of policymakers, no clear visions for where you would go in the future. We assumed that at least in the short term, very little was, was going to happen by way of how governments can respond or would respond. After all, many of these challenges are structural, as Fedi noted. They require institutional reform. They require educational reform. They require investments. And this was not going to happen in the short term, at least. Today, I think we have recognized that the short term is going to be more of a long term, or likely to be one. The preoccupation of everyone with managing crises day to day at the expense of focusing on what is needed uh, is going to last far longer. And in some cases, I would argue it's going to last possibly into, uh, into the next few years or maybe a decade. What can be done meanwhile? What should we be? be thinking about, I think, is where I want to come in and maybe finish with my starting uh, comments. Uh, what can be done, in my view, and maybe, uh, and I would argue that that is the only thing that can be done now. Governments are preoccupied, distracted. They have neither the money, the people, or the ideas to bring about change. If they did, they would have done it in the previous 15 years. Meanwhile, a private sector that I would think remains very hesitant, uh, very unsure. Uh, Fadi is the exception. I wish I could clone him and take him around the region, but he does not exist in most countries. And I would think, I would actually go f so far as to say that after recent events in the region, the private sector is going to be even less engaged. There will be even less money available. The outside world is not paying attention to the region. The only hope we still have of at least getting some things right is for actors who have ideas, whether they happen to be in government, the private sector, entrepreneurs, organizations such as the one that me and Dina work for, coming together and engaging in social innovation. Uh, the, the subject of today's panel is social entrepreneurship. I think social innovation, by and large, is what we need, whether it's about social entrepreneurship ideas and innovations and programs and, and, and entry points to provide access to finance, to provide training, to enhance employability. That is the only thing that will have traction now. And it turns out, in fact, that it's actually a very rewarding plan of attacking these long-term structural problems. After all, they focus on areas that have been neglected, areas that don't require government support only, and they bring about like-minded actors, people like George from Synorgos here, head of the curve, entrepreneurs, uh, banks, all of whom can, I think, respond in the short term and bring about genuine results while we await for things to settle down and for comprehensive changes of institutions and structures to take place. I'm just going to ask you uh, to briefly follow up um, before I bring in Dina and then Chris. Um, you're saying that Fadi's the exception. 
So, and obviously Silatech is working to uh, produce more fatties. So, can, can you maybe perhaps talk to us a little bit about how you conduct your work, how you engage with, with business, with the business community and with governments in the region? What are your talking points uh, and points uh, of entry? I, great question, Leila. And I, I don't think we have a model that has been tested and tried that we're confident of. Um, what we're doing, though, is focusing on areas and identifying partners that we can work with to achieve results in these areas. For example, I'll give maybe two, three concrete examples. Of, and I think this reflects the big frame that Solatec is using, and I would argue many other organizations are using. So in Morocco, we're working with the Postal Bank, a bank that has 3,000 branches across Morocco. We're working with them to introduce savings products for youth, savings schemes that incentivizes youth to actually open up savings accounts so that they have an entry into the banking system. Those savings products can, in the future, uh, generate uh, other products, loans which we are actually offering <coughs> to another banking institution in a place like Yemen. Uh, so that access to finance is done at a very early point, so that micro enterprises and micro entrepreneurs don't only have to rely on families or friends, but actually become bankable from the perspective of the financial system. What it took for that partnership to happen was us designing the right product, having the right partner who saw an interest, and came to this with the same economic objective, but also a commitment to social change. Uh, most of our programs replicate this model. Every other alternative approach, for example, with governments, has taken more time, uh, has, has experienced a lot of setbacks, and I would say eight times out of ten did not go through. Why? Actors are changing. Government officials are moving. That's not their primary area of interest. Uh, and a lot of the, the areas of interesting work that I think have to do with maybe access to finance, teaching entrepreneurs, getting young people to be more employable, they're not sexy. You can't go out there and make a big announcement as a government official and say, we're, we're making 500,000 people more employable. Well, what does that exactly mean? If you make them, if you create jobs for them, I think that would be more appealing to governments. But it turns out, I would argue, that making young people at an early point in life more employable is the right long-term investment. So it is that sort of innovation in the various empty spaces that govern getting a job, getting the right skills, becoming married, having access to the banking system, and becoming a, a, a productive young adult who feels empowered. I think this is at the heart of what we do, and I would go so far as to argue that at this moment in the region, this is the only thing you can do. Can I just add on, please? Just because I think Tarek doesn't always do justice to Silatec and some of the new things that they're doing. I think just to add on, um, one of the very new and different things that Silatec is pushing for is in this issue of youth economic empowerment, you have all these different stakeholders, and previously each, stake, each group of people would talk about it separately as opposed to together. And one of the things that Silatec has been pushing for is to allow for dialogue bef between the public sector, the private sector, civil society, We've done multi-sectoral consultations in Egypt. We'll do another one in Palestine. And to really bring everyone to, ta to the table to see what they can do. And I think the other thing is that um, Silatec is working to engage the private sector as a real partner at the table, not just as uh, give us half a million dollars to you know, support skills development in, in Yemen. We're bringing them to the table as real partners who have something to say, which is what Fedi said. I think, Fedi, you want to say something, don't you? Yeah, but uh, back to the issue of, of the private sector. Um, Tarek, I think we need to, and I know you know that, but I, I think we need to just look at the region differently and away from the traditional players uh, on the ground. I think um, the traditional uh, private sector, which had uh, made its wealth uh, historically through either government contracts, land, uh, oil and gas, whatever, you name it. Uh, it maybe 
some of them are, are quite active, so I mean, to be fair to them. But what you need to look at is the new entrepreneurial society that's popping up in the region, and they are the activists on the ground, and they are the people that are totally in tune with the social issues that are happening. I recently uh, had gathered some people in, uh, to address the economic hardships in, in Jordan uh, about six or seven month ag months ago, so, and I invited uh, to bring in the private sector to address uh, how, to, to come together to see how we're gonna be helping marginalized communities on the ground through Rouen. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I, you know, to support some of the, what you said, is that my friends that come, that are my age and have made it in life, did not show up. Yeah. Who showed up as every single entrepreneur that was under the age of 30, saying, okay, how are we going to bring in our skills, our capabilities, and our small companies? These are the small startups, and they, are, they came out with solutions, they engaged, uh, we don't want to be, you know, e Egypt and, and Tunisia surprised everyone in, in the change, the first change that happened, uh, because everyone ignored that the citizen feels that he's empowered today. I think we need to remember that that feeling continues to, be, to happen, regardless of what you see on the ground today, regardless of the changes. The, uh, the tools and the... Uh, the issues that unleashed empowerment for youth are still there. And we need to be very careful not to look at traditional powers and look somewhere else because that's where things are happening. Yeah. Could, uh, I don't... Do you, Dina, briefly, yeah. I want to um, bring in Chris. I think I'm probably going to go into your question, but I think the youth are finding solutions and changing things on their own. So I've, I'm going to be a bit controversial and say that I think that there are paradigms and ideas that are, if not dead, dying. One of them is capitalism. The other one are concepts of corporate social responsibility. <laughs> In the sense that traditional paradigm, traditional development paradigms, Tariq Yusuf has written about this a lot. Traditional capitalism, Fedi Rondur talks about this all the time. And, and just the way that we see youth, all these things are changing and I think there's a moment where the youth are coming up with completely new business models. So as opposed to them coming and saying, we want to start an NGO, they're saying we want to start a business that's going to solve a major social challenge and that will create jobs and that will expand the economy, but that will solve the issue of garbage collection in Egypt or that will solve the issue of renewable energy. So there's this group of young entrepreneurs who are very civically engaged in the Middle East who are all coming up with amazing ideas about how to solve traditional development problems, including employment. So. And Chris, can you comment on Dina's uh, statement? Do you find that provocative, uh, the, the point about capitalism? Yeah, that, is, is social entrepreneurship sort of a counterpoint to, to capitalism? I, I, and I, I'm, I, not an, I'm not an ism guy, so I, yeah. I'm not here to debate one thing over the other. What I think the fundamental point everyone here is making, and I'll come back to, I think, is, is dead on, and that to me is all that really matters. Okay. Um, I have to confess I have some performance anxiety being here <laughs> because you guys don't know this, well, some of you know this, but you're sitting with three of the most important people <laughs> thinking about these issues right now, and so it's a little bit there. And Leila, I have to tell you, I think it's awesome that you and New America and Dina helping here has brought this forth because I can tell you as the American here, there are lots of journalists who do not want to look at the story that these folks are talking about right now when they look at the Middle East. And I can tell you my experience writing the book that there are not a lot of think tanks that are willing to have a serious dialogue about this because, you know, we have in the West and America and Washington in particular narrative. I mean, all human beings have narrative bias, right? We get stuck in our stories and we think about the world in one way and we have a great deal of difficulty thinking beyond things like Syria and Egypt as places of conflict and difficulty. And this has been the big aha moment for me and what I've seen, you know, happening not just in the Middle East and around the world by simply going there and by simply being with people like the people on here overall. Because I can tell you that in my experience, I have absolutely no clue what Syria is going to look like in three months, and I have no idea what Egypt is going to look like in three years. But to me, the revolution um, that these people are talking about are facilitated by something which I can tell you with 100% certainty, which is that in the next three to five years, there are going to be a lot more people in the Middle East with a lot more technology on their person. And this is changing everything profoundly in very good ways. We sometimes get hung up about technologies being this thing over there that we can't get our minds around and it's like the Silicon Valley thing. But technology in the hands of so many people really become like water or electricity. It's just something that you assume and then you solve all sorts of problems because you have the ability to do it overall. I interviewed a ton of very big senior business executives in the Middle East uh, in mobile companies 
And all of them told me that a place like Egypt, within now two years, was three years, are going to have 50% smartphone penetration. And as you know, most of these countries have 100% phone penetration right now. So 50% smartphone, you know, a lot of us think smartphones are just like sexier phones or they're better ways to watch video. But in point of fact, what they really are is supercomputers in the pockets of 50% of humanity. In fact, in the foreword of my book, Mark Andreessen wrote that he thinks within a decade, two-thirds of humanity, five billion people, will have smartphones in their pocket. This is literally the computer capacity to put a man on the moon in the hands of two-thirds of humanity. This is 100% certain, right? I can't tell you about other things. This is not going away. And the essence of what this means is, as I think these guys have talked about so beautifully, is that so much innovation and problem solving is happening bottom up. Two of my favorite quotes in the book actually came from two of the people sitting on the panel. And it goes not only to technology and business and whether we're talking about social entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, but it actually goes to culture and society and the way people think of each other and how they think of themselves. And Fadi said to me once when we were talking about technology, he said, there's no WASTA on the internet. And for those of you who know what WASTA is, uh, you know what he's saying. But for Americans who have not heard that word, I had not heard the word before I'd gotten there. I mean, it's effectively who do you know? It's a whole system of favors that can be profoundly, culturally impactful for young people who wish to rise and are constantly not able to because they don't know people. So folks used to tell me that if I ever got in trouble in the Middle East, I should pretend to make a phone call to someone because the person who's hassling might in fact think I know somebody and that's kind of wasta in a nutshell. <laughs> but, but what Fadi is saying is that with no wasta in the internet is that you can keep bypassing the traditional things that Tarek was talking about before. And so the entrepreneurs are not sitting around and waiting and saying to themselves, we need to wait a generation to fix education. They're putting on tens of thousands of videos in Arabic online to supplement education, right? I mean, I think one of the great things about technology being in the hands of so many people around the world is that infrastructure problems are viewed as software problems. You can really do really innovative things by connecting people overall. And the outcome of that is my second favorite quote, which I think in many ways makes a distinction between the top-down world and the bottom-up world, which is becoming strengthened that came from Dina to me and just hit me like a two by four, where she said, you know, top down world thinks of people as problems, but in the bottom up, people are assets, meaning everyone has got an opportunity to solve a problem in their backyard, and that's what's facilitated. And my last comment would be, therefore, that in some respects to your original question, the line between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, and by the way, I see this in Silicon Valley even, the line between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is starting to blur significantly. Because a new generation of people are saying, look, I'm happy to make money and I'd love to be very successful, that's great. But the way I run my company is going to be under certain paradigms. And by the way, again, I can solve a lot of very, very interesting problems by being able, one, to see how the rest of the world lives, two, to be able to connect with each other in very, very powerful ways, three, to innovate with each other very effectively and cost effectively because it's much cheaper to solve some of these problems this way. And then remember, I mean, it's a mind blow when I stop to think about this. It seems so obvious, but it really sort of blows me away. You know, is essentially all of the world's knowledge is at our fingertips essentially for free. Now, and anyone who thinks that this is, we're not entering a different world or that the traditional methods are somehow going to be the dominant force of the next 10 years because they were in the last 10 years, I don't think are asking some of the really most basic, in some respects, obvious questions. Great. So I w want to um, talk a little bit about why I asked the question about capitalism. And that is because uh, we've we've sort of overlooked the fact that a lot of people who were in the streets in these mass uprisings were actually there because they were dissatisfied or disaffected by, uh, by an economic approach which favored foreign investment, which favored uh, um, serving foreign interests, which, you know, they were, they were there to basically uh, represent a critique of, of how... Uh, how the West and how uh, p states in the region have really uh, engaged uh, in a way that has kept people at home, uh, harmed people's jobs, uh, and so forth. And I think that this is something that's really overlooked. I mean, we here in the West think a lot more about the political side of grievances and not so much the economics. And so I want to um, ask the panelists to reflect a bit on um, U.S. policy, on the role of the West in both uh, private sector development and uh, more broadly um, uh, development assistance. I mean, I'm going to open it up and say, you know, is U.S. policy harmful or helpful to social entrepreneurship? You want to go first? Um, 
uh, quickly, and then I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Dina take this. Um, I, I don't know if I want to address the, the U.S. issue, but let me address the issue of, of, uh, of capitalism and, and maybe governance and democracy. So I, I would, uh, I don't think people on the street were, I don't think there is an encouragement of foreign investment in the Arab world. So let, that, that is a misconception. We don't, we don't accept foreign investment easily. The, the ownership laws in most of the countries in the Arab world do not encourage foreign investment. So let's put that to rest. We suffer miserably in the Arab world for an Arab to go up, out, and, 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 and establish a company in a neighboring Arab country because we're not allowed to have 100% ownership of our businesses. So let's, let's put that to sleep. In fact, if, if the Arab countries have brought down the borders of trade, and allowed for foreign investment to come, not because of capital, but because we want knowledge to come. We want these Western companies to come and share knowledge with us and the transfer of knowledge and technology into the region, which needs it badly. We certainly don't need capital in the Arab world. We are rich countries in most of the Arab countries, and we can address all our economic issues from the countries that have the wealth. So let's, I mean, that's, that's a misconception. There is an anti-private sector attitude, yes, because the, they think the private sector is, is a profit maximizer and does not look at society in general and, and its well-being. But the critical issue for job creation in the Arab world is that Arabs trade with each other only 10% of their total trade. And if we think of jobs, of, of, of instead of trade aid, aid, and Mike is, is from, from, uh, from USAID, if we move from the aid mentality into the trade mentality and bring down the borders of moving people, goods, and capital, very simple formula. The, the Arab free trade uh, uh, agreement had been discussed long before the Europeans ever thought about having one, one region. Uh, then I would tell you, you are going to create one a heck of a lot of jobs in the region. So uh, that is what is missing in the region, the ability uh, of, of, of having that. So the issue of capitalism is, is, is not understood very well uh, in, in that sense. Perhaps it needs to be re, uh, reconceived. Uh, Chris, you had a comment? Regina, you go first, oh. and then I'll add something. Um, okay, I don't really know where to start. It's a loaded question. I think um, the... I think the discourse in the U.S. has forgotten that at the core of all of these uprisings, and I use uprisings and not revolutions very carefully, um, is, economic, is economics and the need for youth economic empowerment. And this is what Tarek Yusuf calls the generation in waiting. Um, for those of you who have not read that book, I urge you all to read it. And this is really a generation that is not just waiting for jobs, but they're waiting for you know, social equity, empowerment, inclus inclusivity, many things that are missing or that were previously missing um, pre-2011. Um, I think what's happening now is that youth are no longer waiting for governments to help them. They're no longer waiting for foreign aid to help them. They're no longer waiting for uh, charity from NGOs or philanthropy, they're out there and they're saying, this is a problem. We are now empowered because the fear factor is gone. They suddenly realize that they are citizens, they have a voice, they can make a difference. And they're coming up with these brilliant business models and are trying to fix these problems and create jobs on their own. Um, having said that, that doesn't mean that there aren't challenges holding them back and that they do not need a lot of support, access to capital, mentorship, capacity building, uh, connections, social capital, et cetera, et cetera. But they are out there and they are trying to make a difference. Um, the issue of traditional capitalism, and I said, when I said I think traditional capitalism is dead, um, everything Fedi said is right, and I think Tarit will have a lot more to say about open markets in the Middle East and what that can do for job creation. But when I say traditional capitalism is dead, I mean that business as usual no longer applies. So this whole notion of businesses being created to just make money really is dead, whether it be here or in the Middle East. Maybe new and emerging business models are still forming, are still not on solid footing, but it's happening. Um, multinationals, large businesses can no longer get away with just saying, we're here and we're here to make money. That's, that just doesn't work anymore. 
And I think what's happening now is that young entrepreneurs who are trying to start new businesses are all integrating this notion of social innovation at the core of their business models as the already existing businesses, large businesses, multinationals are struggling to figure out how to do that. So they're already doing it. They're doing it from the get-go. And I think Synergos, uh, George Khalaf is here, the Arab Innovations Program. They knew this was happening early on and they started this program several years back. Um, the issue of the U.S. I've been here for about five weeks, and you know, Leila has <laughs> Leila has uh, graciously connected me to a lot of people. I've attended a lot of talks, a lot of events. Every other day, there is a talk about the Middle East in this city. Um, I think that the U.S. foreign policy is heavily focused on democracy, uh, political reform, security, and they talk about economics. It's not that they don't talk about it but they're not doing anything to support economic empowerment. I think they're one of the most significant initiatives that were launched were, were the Egyptian American Entrepreneurship Fund and the Tunisian American Entrepreneurship Fund, and Obama has many times said that we are committed to entrepreneurship, supporting job creation, enterprise development, but these funds have yet to really materialize in a big way, and they have, you know, $60 million was approved to go into the Egyptian American Fund. That's $60 million to help create how many jobs do we need, Tarek, to create in Egypt a year? A million. A million jobs a year, $60 million versus $1.3 billion in military aid. Yes, granted, they stopped that. But still, the whole question of how aid <laughs> needs to, the restructuring of U.S. aid really needs to be thought out and really needs to be thought out in light of the fact that nobody is going to wait for the U.S. to support them. They're doing it anyway. So I think if the, the question that needs to be asked is how the U.S. can really support players on the ground, empower their people, and build up the, the new and budding entrepreneurial cult culture that is there. Okay. Uh, Tarek, do you want to comment a bit on you know, whether the Gulf is a partner in this enterprise? Um, is it the U.S.? I mean, wh where, who can help? And then Chris, yeah. Thanks. Leila, you're asking this, if you had asked me this question four or five months ago, I would have said um, the Gulf is in a position to help, should be encouraged to help, and will hopefully provide the necessary help. Already a few months ago, it became, it was obviously clear to me and many other people that the West wasn't helping. Uh, if the Arab Spring fails, and I hope it doesn't, it's fighting for its life at this moment. It will be in part because the West did not respond. Um, the West looked the other way, was too distracted, too busy. The funds put on the table really were nowhere as significant or could have made a difference. Uh, a number of governments were fought, uh, were left fighting for their own short-term stability. And I would argue that, in fact, one of the catastrophic mistakes made by the U.S. and Europe in thinking, in supporting their transition is that they looked the other way too soon. Uh, they left these countries to their own internal circumstances, regional outlooks, a number of which were very negative in the very first place. So uh, the West had sort of looked the other way, and the Gulf countries uh, were in a position to help. Uh, unfortunately, I think in light of recent events, uh, it's looking also the case that most Gulf countries are not in a position to help. Uh, countries such as Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Yemen, uh, particularly because these are countries that are capital starved, are going to become more capital starved in the near future. They're going to be left more uh, to fight for their own short-term stability. Uh, Gulf money th uh, that would have flown perhaps a few months ago without too many questions asked now will come. Uh, at a moment where there's massive polarization, not just within countries, but between countries, and a great deal of mistrust regarding the intentions behind whatever funding or support that's being provided. It's also the case, Leila, that much, much of the funding that has gone into these countries so far is not the kind of funding that will support the things we have been talking about. You know, providing support for budgets, for subsidies, for border controls, for counterterrorism, that's not supporting Arab youth. That's not supporting these transitions to actually succeed. Uh, this is buying time. This is buying favor. 
the sort of funding that perhaps can still happen, will happen hopefully, and you know, you mentioned $60 million, I think, between me and Fadi in the next few months, we're going to be raising hopefully one fund at least with $60 million. We want to raise, we want, we want other people to do more of this. So private individuals, actors, social innovators, coalitions of people like us can do uh, a lot of this. The kind of funding that we need is funding that will in fact be bottom up. Do the kind of things that Chris have been talking about. Funding that will go to entrepreneurs, funding that will go to innovators, funding that will go to some government agencies that are doing the sort of thing uh, that we all feel uh, confident about. Uh, I don't know how that funding is going to flow in in the middle of the short-term stability and the uncertainty, but if there are ways in which we can support it, incentivize it, that will be the funding, in my view, that will bring about long-term outcomes, that will bring the right results and will help push these Arab very fragile transitions in the region to a, to, towards greater stability. But the outside world, the traditional challenge, channels for uh, capital flows, the aid, I have to admit, has, has been a dismal failure since the onset of, uh, of these revolutions. And if changes, if the, if, the, if the desired change in the region fails to materialize, um, there's a lot of blame that will have to be uh, allotted to important actors, partners of this region who stood by and let very important transitions uh, somehow slide into complete instability and a reversal of what two years ago looked like a very important uh, events for the region. Chris, you wanted to comment and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I just, I, I loved actually this exchange in many ways because it was something when I was reporting over the last year about this that I kept, it was, seemed like a dichotomy, dichotomy to me, but it really wasn't because you had Dina at one level who's talking about this is happening anyways and it's happening bottom up and it's not going back, which I completely agree with. And yet Tarek is pointing out, which is absolutely true also, which is that governments are playing a role. Even governments doing the wrong thing by definition is playing a role because uh, they're there and they're present and they control borders and other things that have to do with the motion of good and everything else. How do you square these two things? And, and I became persuaded they're really not a dichotomy at all. They're just both realities. I mean, that we, we, all my excitement about technology and all the potential I talked about before I think is unarguable. But at the same time, ecosystems matter. Your ability to have a rule of law, your ability to do a lot of very basic things in the motion, as Fadi said, of, of people and ideas is the difference between having a great 21st century economy and not. And so we've come back, because I will speak bluntly about the American government, maybe in ways folks here not. Mike, Mike is a hero, right? And there are heroes and patriots who really get bottom up and think about it. But they're playing in a world that is, one, unbelievably top down by definition and structure. They really don't have the mentality or the thought about how to address in scalable ways things that are happening bought up. And very, very bluntly, a lot of your sisters and brothers who are in serving government now, and by the way, it's not just older people. I mean, it's amazing how there are young people I know in the State Department in their 20s who've sort of become cold warriors in their outlook towards the great grand bargains of life and what is becoming a very, very different world. And what I say, and I'm asked often by our government, you know, so what should we do about all this? And, and my first line is a little bit sarcastic, but it's actually, I believe it. I say, just stop talking about it. I mean, as Dina said, you know, there are speeches all the time. But, but the fact of the matter is there's so many basic little things that government could actually get right somewhat under the aegis of sort of getting out of the way of what happens. Let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about. It's very illustrative. Well, I'll give you two examples, very quick ones. One, I don't know what the real number is, but the very fact that I'm told this is interesting in and of themselves. But that this Department of State has 17 separate offices of global entrepreneurship. Now, Mike, you could tell me. Maybe it's 10, but it isn't one. And that's just the State Department, Right. So what kind of coordination over, as they've pointed out, are very, very small? I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousand of dollars, maybe a couple of million dollars in the grand scheme of things. How effective or efficient is that ever going to be possibly in any kind of engagement? So if you're going to have that in and of itself, stop talking about it and fix that. But here's a story which I think tells you a lot about our times and is worth thinking about things going forward. I met this wonderful startup, amazing young guys, excellent uh, engineers by any standard of anything I've seen in the world from Cairo. And they were pitching an idea, and lo and behold, two very, very, very well-regarded Silicon Valley venture capital funds wanted to bring them from Cairo to Silicon Valley to look to invest in them. They said, look, you need to be here in the first week of June. We're looking at two other companies that are just like you. This is not going to happen over Skype. You've got to come to Silicon Valley. And this was in late April. You've got a month, but if you're not there, you're, we're going to move on. So lo and behold, they go down to our embassy and say, I need a visa because I've got to get to Silicon Valley in a month. And they said, come back in August and we'll interview you you know, stop talking about it. At that point, 
stop talking about it. Great. Okay. We're going to open it for questions. There's a standing mic in the back, if you don't mind uh, lining up um, in the back, asking your question from the back. Um, Meanwhile, I, I, can yes, I say yes, a couple of please, things? Please. Just to, to uh, I, I think uh, as we talk about economic empowerment and, uh, and democracy in the region and America, U.S. policy in the region, one needs to look at at, at governance and not democracy. And uh, the people in the street expect their governments to deliver, uh, whether democratically e elected or not. And I think we're no looking, and, and we've had, uh, and we can have a long discussion with Tariq about this. Uh, the issue of democracy takes a long time. Uh, as I had said once in a previous panel with Chris, is that we're a startup in democracy, so we need to take a long time to address the issue beyond the ballot box. It is not about the ballot box. People, the Tamarud people in Egypt went down to the street because they did not have bread, mostly. That's my view of it. Uh, it is about delivery uh, of, of services and delivery of jobs at the end of the day. And that's where, where the biggest challenge is. The poster child, the, my last comment, the poster child of the Egyptian revolution in the West, Wael Ghunayim today, if you look at him and say, where is Wael? Do you know where Wael is today? Nobody knows where Wael is, but Wael decided not to be in politics. Uh, I had a long discussion with him. Many of you, uh, many here had had a long discussion with him. Wael decided he wanted to start and has started something called Tahrir Academy. What does Tahrir Academy do? Exactly like Khan Academy. Because Wael thinks it is about educating these kids that are going to graduate and think about governance issues when they grow up, rather than us telling people here, Shove democracy down your throat and go vote, and then let us all suffer because of the, uh, the consequences of what we've, we've elected. So uh, uh, we, that the US policy in the region needs to think about that very, very carefully. When to tell us that the Western model actually works. In today's world, the streets are empty because your government is shut down. <laughs> I'm going to open it for questions, and then if you have additional comments, you can uh, add them um, in response to the questions. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Greg Simpson. I'm with the Center for International and Private Enterprise. We're one of the four core institutes of the, of the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, and uh, democracy is about leadership selection. It's also about decision making. And I'm not sure how you get these policies right if you don't have a democratic decision making process. Um, and that kind of gets to my question, which is, where does the informal sector fit into all this? Um, Hernando de Soto went and talked to some of the relatives and friends of Mohammed Bouazizi and learned that for him to have gotten licensed as a fruit vendor in Tunisia would have taken 42 administrative steps, 152 days of standing in line, and $3,200 in income, which is for him, which is for him a, a year's income. There was frustration in the streets about economic issues, but it wasn't just about uh, the capitalist model or not capitalist model, it was about access, the system not working for them. And so many of the things you're talking about will work wonderfully for the people who all already, for, the, for whom the institutions are already working, and they already have the resources to get access to these institutions. But what about the informal sector for whom the system isn't working? How does that, how does that factor into the work that you're doing? Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your question directly, but... Uh, You've highlighted precisely one of the flaws in the social innovation movement we've been talking about earlier. Uh, social innovation, by its very construction, as we see it, as we have been promoting it, is about marginal incremental change. It's about working in the spaces where you can get things done. It is not a substitute for long-term economic or institutional reform, the sort of issues you have raised, which apply not just in Tunisia, but in Libya and Egypt and elsewhere, about property rights, the risk of expropriation, rule of law. These are the sort of things that require governments that have visions, that are stable, uh, that are accountable to do them. And so, yes, uh, we will not necessarily be able to tackle all of these issues through social innovation, but perhaps by demonstrating how social innovation works, we can affect the mindset of policymakers and get people to think creatively and innovatively about things, as opposed to waiting for things to settle down and to become far more stable. I agree with you, and that would have been what I would have sort of footnoted what Fadi said earlier. 
regarding governance or democratization, the outcome matters in this, the, the end game matters, and the process as a result matters. Um, we have to feel confident that whatever set of political um, dynamics in a transition, whatever set of ingredients we choose for that, whether it's through a, an elected parliament, a pseudo-elected parliament, an interim constitution, an interim government, or a military dictatorship, has to get us to the right end result. If it doesn't get us to the right end result, there is no need for us to play a game for another couple of decades in the region of somehow justifying the status quo of the present simply because we cannot get the desired outcome in place. And that, that level of clarity, I think, has to be uh, articulated, has to be, uh, has to be uh, uh, engaged with, and that's one area where the outside world should talk to policymakers and should call things as they are, as opposed to how we try in the region often to sell them. Do you, do you think that the Please, entrepreneurs, sorry, the people the, you're trying we to We only help, have uh, time for one question. I'm sorry, I just per, want to know if they have a role to play in helping get the policies right for others. I wondered if you're factoring that into the work you're doing. Who? Sorry. Totally. And I, I think, I mean, to address your issue, and part of the things that we're doing on the ground with the private sector is how does the private sector, which has access, private sector, the powerful private, private sector, not all private enterprise, the private sector that has access, that prides itself on access, um, and cares about the stability of society, because when you have a stable society, you're actually selling more and you're making more profit. Uh, we're saying, uh, use that access to create laws that are inclusive, to bring these kids who are in the informal sector uh, to be part of the formal sector so that they can feel that they have a sense of ownership in their societies and thus stability. And a big part of the, 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 the instability in the region is that these kids that go down to the street don't feel that they have a sense of ownership or, or are losing anything by actually top, toppling regimes or, or, or even or, or, or be even creating uh, havoc and chaos in, in, in the society that li they live in. So the private sector has, yes, has a very important job that says, here, go knock on policymakers' doors and tell them rule of law and inclusiveness is essential for you. I mean, that's, that's what I think that the change of roles needs to be, partnering with the public sector to address these issues. Because it's in everybody's interest at the end of the day, in, in, in a very selfish manner. I think just to add, I don't, your, your question, Greg, is really important, and I think it's important to realize that everyone at this table and everyone that we work with thinks very carefully about policy, policy reform, governance, and process, as Tarek Yusuf said, and, you know, everyone here is launching some kind of initiative to support what is happening on the ground, specifically with regards to enterprise development, you know. Uh, Fedi launched something called Corporate Entrepreneurship Responsibility. Um, ahead of the Curve is launching something called Entrepreneurship with Impact. Silitech has a whole entire unit that's working on research and policy and that is meant to really engage governments, the private sector, and in the process. But specifically with your question regarding informal sector, everyone is aware that the informal sector is massive and we need to find ways to, to formalize that sector and bring all of these small micro businesses and this is something that Silitec takes very seriously and it's something that you know even within our initiative entrepreneurship with impact there are a lot of social entrepreneurs at the base of the pyramid who have started small businesses around a problem that they face on a daily basis so everyone I think is thinking about these issues and I think this is where you come to the question that Leila asked which is how can the US help and the U.S. should really think about how to partner with these solid initiatives happening on the ground. And, you know, there are a lot of programs that exist under U.S. aid. It's just how that money is funneled to the bottom is so hard and needs to be rethought. It really doesn't make it anywhere significant. So I think, you know. Please. Um, hi. I am. Um Really appreciate that dialogue. I didn't mind that he asked a follow-up question, although they might mind because this is this we're right at the Please. heart of the issue here. Good. Um, Ask yours, uh, and uh, half of these youth are in the informal sector, and it's it, 
Ah, oh yeah, Bill Lawrence. I fought in the trenches for a long time in the State Department on this stuff, and then recently with Crisis Group, and now I'm teaching at GW. Um, the uh, this is this is this is critical. Uh, now, I worked at State Department in a lot of these programs and early on, and our, our main problem was not that we didn't understand what was going on. We we saw this. Our main problem was that we we saw these massive structural changes that would cause instability, and we didn't understand why there wasn't a revolution. It was that all the books and all the analysis in the 2000s were about the durability of authoritarian regimes, which is very critical because now we're seeing a lot of the vestiges of those old states reasserting themselves and in, in re-authoritizing things, if I can coin a term, and, 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 and a lot of sort of the wiring of the old state, getting back to this informal section, is there. I mean, right now, Tunisia has declared war on the informal sector. They've linked it to terrorism, they've linked it to arms smuggling, and we're back to chasing the Bouazizis away. Um, so so we're, uh, Tunisia's going exactly in the wrong direction in terms of government policy. Um, uh, Tadek mentioned uh, uh, that we need to make kids more employable, and I agree with that, but I agree also with the other panelists that it's really not, it's less about employable, it's more about making them entrepreneurial. Um, you, talk, you guys talked about savings products from Morocco. I'm almost done. Um, the, uh, 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 but I, as you said, it's much more about capital flows. I mean, we were researching in Tunisia, and again, I started a lot of these programs at state. We could only find one bona fide venture capitalist in Tunisia. And you, and you go around, there's no venture capital in the region of, of note, and, and most of the investment. Got, that's going to change very soon. Starting to change, yeah. <laughs> but that, that was where a lot of these programs were trying to go. So, um, and talk about liberalization in terms of the question you asked about liberalization and capitalism being questioned. I mean, the, the, the pro problem we found in the region was not liberalization without democracy or liberalization without a social safety net. We found liberalization without liberalization. You, you, you had liberalization leading towards kleptocratic governments and crony yeah. capitalism and all that. So Thanks. you have all of that and reasserting itself. One final point. Right now with the transfer of all those companies, the Trebelsi and Ben Ali family controlled in Tunisia, right? That's not going to people with clean hands. We had a big discussion about it at an event recently in D.C. It's going to people with questionable hands. So, so, um, so the, the revolution hasn't borne the fruit, and a lot of this is not through lack of analysis. Thank We're you. all watching it go on. Thank so you. My, here my question is, okay. just to finish. <laughs> um, you sound like Arabs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speeches. 12 years in the region. So, um, so I, I think it's all about mobilizing youth to solve problems, getting to what Dina was saying. And I think we need to turn the universities, we need to turn all these institutions around into setting youth at solving problems and think less about training and less about uh, uh, sure. you know, a lot of these sort of macro sure. things and supporting budgets and, 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 and actually ride the wave of what youth are doing already because youth have a lot of the tools, but they don't have all the tools. That's what okay. What, what, what I want just, uh, you know, the, you, the kids are going out and doing things regardless of what policymakers are doing. You, you have to know that. I mean, they really care less about what policymakers do. And that's the issue of the, the informal sector. A lot of it is voluntarily informal. I mean, they don't want to be formal because back to the issue of Tunisia, if you wage war on the informal sector, you're effectively waging war for taxation and formalization for their own purposes. So if you want to make them formal and you want them inclusive, it's not, it's not to cripple them because the cost of doing business is also high. So if you're in the informal sector, you're able to start up your business without having to worry about registering a company and, and getting killed by, by doing that as a business before you actually sell your, your first product. Go ahead. Can you please uh, state your name, affiliation, and question briefly? My name is Ayase Hati. I'm a Saudi businesswoman and um, a head of the um, Entrepreneurship Action Council. My question is about uh, policies, trade policies in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really a barrier for a lot of smaller, medium-ish sized businesses that would like to um, enjoy possibility of supply chains across, uh, uh, across the Middle East. And so m a thought that I toy with a question is how can we circumvent policy, uh, you know, those policies that cripple us um, are, are there ways to create platforms that are governed by uh, private law, for example, in order to facilitate more trade? Um, Can you give an example of a policy that acts as a barrier? Uh, an exactly. Plenty. Uh, I, 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 I get it. I mean, I, th th I spend my life okay. today trying to help young entrepreneurs understand 
how to set up businesses across the region. I mean, I'm, if you don't know, I'm, 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 I'm an angel investor. I invest in a heck of a lot of companies in the region. They don't want my money most of the time. They want my knowledge and how did I set up a business across borders in the Arab world. That's the biggest enigma of them all. And it took, it took decades to do that. And that's the biggest issue for the youth today. How am I going to start a business in Jordan or in Lebanon, take the dust of it, and say, I want to implement this policy now because I want to encourage trade, not be a protectionist uh, society. And we are today a very protectionist region. We don't want people, we, we don't mind buying from the West, but we are scared to death to sell to each other. Thank you. Uh, you should ask Tarek Yusuf yeah. about that. He's been writing know, about it know. since yeah. 2000 and... About what? <laughs> Trade I, I, you, yeah, you're catching me at a moment where my faith in this region is at an all-time low. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it happening. Yeah, but I mean, how can you facilitate uh, it through private law or some sort of... A I, I'm, not even, I'm not even thinking about that. Doesn't. There is far more interesting things that you can do with, at the national level in, some, in a lot of these countries than for you to imagine trade barriers coming down or... Unless, of course, you've got people like Fadi who can creatively arbitrage these constraints <laughs> and teach others how to do that. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of them. Uh, you know, after 2011, the Arab world was coming apart, not coming together. And uh, this affected not just trade, but a host of other areas where typically you would think there, is, there ought to be more connectivity. Movement of people, movement of ideas, movement of commodities and... So um, that is not one uh, lucrative area for engagement at the moment. But perhaps just uh, people invoked the informal sector in a number of questions right now, and I just wanted to, to make a couple of quick comments just to do, do justice to the issue. You can still work with informal entrepreneurs and support them without requiring them to become formalized. Uh, for example, in the case of Yemen, most informal entrepreneurs cannot access loans through the banking system because they don't have collateral, not because they don't have registered businesses. Most of the 90% of their businesses are not registered. We actually happen to run one of the biggest youth loan uh, f uh, program in, in Yemen that has now become a model for doing it elsewhere. And the idea there is essentially to work with young entrepreneurs to make them more bankable, to lower the requirements for collateral, or provide loan guarantees, something that nobody in the region does. Uh, but, and, and finally, Bill, and perhaps to you and to others, not everyone wants to become an entrepreneur. Let's also be very cognizant of this. So making young people more employable, making them more employable is, is, is giving them more choices, uh, is allowing them to discover who they are and allow employers, large employers in particular, to, uh, to help select those who perhaps are better fit. So more Making them more employable is not just about writing CVs anymore. It's about a host of other skills that will allow them to become uh, long-term uh, long learners, uh, to become more marketable to multiple sectors. It's about a lot of the soft skills. I mean, the soft skills from entrepreneurship, and I'll just stop with this. Uh, I have discovered recently one, one of the biggest benefits from entrepreneurship has little to do with the entrepreneurs themselves becoming entrepreneurs eventually. It's about the mindset change that happens. Exactly. It's the skills. It's the the approach to life, it's the attitude. This is empowerment. This, yeah. is, this is the kind of education that allows young people to not be dependent on the state or the large employer or on me or you. Uh, Tunisia in particular, uh, th there's a lot of this happening in Tunisia. And, you know, not to, not to over, over sort of, yes, we need more venture capital funds in Tunisia. We need a lot of SM, uh, other uh, modalities for SME support in Tunisia. Uh, you know, it was frightening for, for me just to discover until recently that not a single microfinance institution was legal under the Central Bank of Tunisia until just a few months ago. This is a country that we considered for about a decade and a half the leading reformer in the region. Not a single it, micro... And, but, but that's, that's in, 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 in Western view. For those of us who were trying to do business in Tunisia, Tariq, we knew that Tunisia was not an open market. Yes. Yeah. Only Westerners yeah. said, here's a model. Yes. And it was primarily because of, of the liberalizing issues rela re re relating to women, which is great. Yeah. 
But everything else was not working in yes, Tunis. Absolutely. <laughs> so as a result of engaging with the central bank and policymakers, there is a law now in place that has just been, uh, I think, adopted a few months ago. And as a result of this, we'll have five microfinance institutions in Tunisia by the end of the year, possibly. That is not small change. That is big change. That will affect tens of thousands of individuals out in the rural areas who have absolutely no possibility otherwise of accessing any kind of finance. Uh, and in, you know, increasingly, we're not just providing finance. We're providing training, financial literacy, how to manage your business. The things that I was in D.C. Uh, foolishly taking for granted as things that actually were out there in the region that a young person could go and learn how to fill out an application to get a loan and submit a business plan. No. And if this is true in Tunisia, could you imagine the situation in Morocco, Yemen, Egypt, Syria? Maybe, Tariq, you can say, how, talking about the informal sector, you know, there are, uh, there is over $3 billion, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, in, 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 in microfinance loans in the Arab world already. This is giving money to the unbankable, yeah. right? Am I right? Yes. Uh, three yes, billion? So $3 billion and over, I think, two or three million borrowers, 85% of them are women, and payback is 97, 98%. These are unbankable people. They come back, they pay back, and they are as bankable as any, any of the big businessmen in the Arab world. In fact, it's, it's the big name lending that, that's created banking crisis in the Arab world, not, <laughs> not microfinance. So uh, they are out there. They are one or two person jobs, but they're, they're actively engaged and they go out. I'm, I'm involved with, what, with one of the microfinance institutions and they are very dynamic people. We don't know that about the Arab world. I'm pretty sure you don't know that uh, because you're only looking at the politics of it. But the women are out there are going out and creating micro businesses that uh, is providing food for the family. Sorry. And they don't want to be in the formal sector. <laughs> they don't want to because they can't. When you borrow $300, and it's going to cost you $1,000 to register a company, you're certainly not going to register a company, and certainly not pay taxes, and they shouldn't be paying taxes. But you also said they want to scale, so... Uh, but why scale? I mean, I mean, the issue of scale is some, you know, you can sell to your neighbor, or if you want to big, uh, create a big business, you want to sell to your neighboring country. But if you don't want to sell to your neighboring country, at least allow them to sell to their neighbor. Okay. I mean, uh, scale is, is relative. I'm going to take three very quick, uh, brief questions, and then we'll let the panelists talk more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Patricia Lane <laughs> with Making Sense International, and we're working with Silatech on helping rural youth become more bankable, employable, and start their own businesses. I've just come back from Morocco and Tunisia, and Tarek, I'm happy to report that there is reason to be encouraged about Tunisia. Um, I went to Sidi Bouzid, which is where the revolution started. I met with an amazing NGO started by young people there. And what I heard from them is what they want is hope and encouragement and a little bit of cash. So uh, the problem is it's very difficult for them to get the cash from USAID or any of the US agencies. They don't know how to raise money from other governments or their own government. They want people-to-people -people type of uh, connections. And I guess my question is, maybe it's a challenge for this audience, is how can we connect those young people with young people here on this campus in other cities and young people in cities of other countries as well? Because I think that that's where the change is going to happen. So that's my question, is how can we do more youth-to-youth -youth exchange for hope, encouragement, and cash? Thank you. Thank so, you. So yeah, I'll answer Fadi, very quickly. Fadi, can we just take I want a to tell you about the program I have with GW. You will have the opportunity. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to let uh, two more questions. Okay. Very brief. Uh, my name's Katie Paul. I'm from the Capital Archaeological Institute, and we've actually been working on an MOU with the Egyptian government regarding the looting of antiquities and how it affects the tourism economy and the economy as a whole. And we've talked a lot about the informal sector and opening trade, but not much about the negative repercussions, and that is the illicit trade of antiquities, of weapons, the illicit movement of people and other, and other objects, and how that could further destabilize the region without any sort of governance around those issues. And do you see a role for maybe the Arab League to create a more regional policy with regard to trade? Thank you. Arab League is the wrong place to even... Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that, that was a quick answer. Direction. Next, please. What Arab League? Hi, Jeffrey King, what National League? Endowment for Democracy. But could there be an alternative, I suppose? Um, quickly, Fadi, I'd like to hear more about um, 
your idea of specifically how private sector and business can be more involved in education in the short run, right. um, public education, private education, things like Khan Academy. And then more generally, um, how does local civil society fit into this? I mean, it sounds to me I've, you know, that in, in some ways this model is a civil societyization of business. Mm -hmm. And is it in the long term more sustainable than the traditional model of civil society with donors and funding? Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. Yes. Uh, Fadi, you want to start and yes, so, we'll so go down the line? Yes. So just very quickly, so there is a very small program that, that my company, RMX, has with the Middle East Studies program here at GW. Uh, I think you have some people that have gone, used that program. We, they, the, the students go to the, to, to the Arab world to study. Arabic, and the program uh, basically stipulates that if you want to study Arabic, you can do that, but you have to participate and volunteer in an NGO or in a, with a social entrepreneur on the ground so that you actually feel what's happening in the region. And it's been, this is our third year, it's very successful. They tell me that the students here like it very much. Here's one of the graduates over there. So, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, there is small. Uh, but there's plenty of nonprofits on the ground that, that would love to have volunteers come over and work there. I mean, they, they, this is, they're all open. Chris, do you have... Uh, that, what's the other question? I forgot. Other, the, <laughs> let's, there's so many other questions. Do you um, model I'm, of civil society... I'm going to randomly answer. So the civil societization of the private sector um, I think is related to also um, the earlier question about should we not just look at youth to solve problems and push youth to solve problems. A lot of people ask me, so my background is initially very civil society focused. And I often ask, get asked the question, why are you bailing on civil society and going to the evil private sector and saying that everyone should start a business? And the answer to that is very simple. I think civil society is very bogged down by a lot of um, stigma and inability to bring in top talent and pay competitive salaries and go to scale quickly. And I think the, the private sector is a much more dynamic place. Is it more sustainable to have businesses adopt social challenges? I absolutely think it's more sustainable. Businesses are much quicker to go to scale. They're much more malleable. They're much more innovative. Um, and. and you know, it's a model that needs to be tested, and, and that's what we're doing in the Middle East. We're not waiting for anybody. We're going to test and see whether these social businesses can... We don't have time, really, to waste in the Middle East. We have to create jobs. We have to solve problems related to education, related to health care, related to employability. So we can't focus on entrepreneurship and, in, and ignore employability or delay that and just focus on that. We have to do everything at the same time. We just don't have the time to wait. There are so many pressing challenges, and we have the largest youth bulge in the world right now. So I think social businesses have the potential to create jobs, to solve major challenges, and to be sustainable and scalable, which is something you won't find in civil society alone, and you won't find in a traditional business model alone. And that's really what we're aiming and pushing to see. And there are a lot of great examples of people doing this. Um, and the ahead of the curve, supported by Silatex, supported by Aramex, supported by many different people, is, is carrying out a study right now um, looking at trends in responsible business practice and social entrepreneurship that will be launched in February 2014. And there are over 50 examples of amazing, viable, profitable businesses that are solving, solving major challenges. And you know, take a look at that when that comes out. The other thing is related to mentorship. Um, and or connecting youth here with youth in the Middle East. or I, I think this issue of connectivity of youth here and youth in the Middle East and or mentors here with youth in the Middle East is very, very important. And um, how many of you have heard of Kiva? I'm sure almost everyone. Yeah. How many of you know that there is something called Kiva Arab Youth? Prob probably not enough. So Silatech helped support Kiva Arab Youth Initiative, and I think Tara is probably better to talk about this than me, but um, Kiva Arab Youth had 100,000 individuals give loans uh, in the Middle East, and this has led to the creation of micro-ventures, the creation of jobs, the creation of income, and these loans are between 50 to $100. Very small amounts can really make a difference, and that's a way for people here to connect with people there. Did I say that right, Tara? Actually, 
Kiva is an, indi is an indictment of the CEO who runs the organization that sponsored at Kiva Arab World. The first time my own colleagues came to me and talked about crowdfunding in the micro enterprise space, at the end of the meeting, I, or immediately, I, I think five minutes into the discussion, I said, first of all, I have no idea what Kiva is. <laughs> Two, I think this is pretty crazy. Uh, but we went down the path of experimenting with it. That's what social innovation is about. And the statistics that you've quoted, indeed, now statistics for the first year alone, I didn't think that you would find 100 people who would go online and give loans, let alone 100,000 individuals who would support the creation of three, 4,000 enterprises in the span of, uh, of, of one year. That is social innovation at work. There are a lot of things, actually, where the, you sit behind the desk. Some youngster is talking to you about some innovative idea, invariably using technology to scale up uh, the idea. And you are completely sort of bewildered. And half the time, my response is, I have no idea what you're talking about, but let us experiment with this. And just a quick example along the same lines. Uh, we launched a, an SMS-based service in Tunisia called Najihni recently. It's an SMS-based service to teach young people uh, how to write a CV or maybe how to learn English. Uh, everything about the program looked very dubious and undoable when it was first presented to management. Nonetheless, we decided to go ahead with it because we had a partner in the private sector and a partner in government that supported it. Uh, the first month's forecast for how many people would subscribe to this free service was, well, maybe you'll get 50,000 people if you're lucky in the first month. And I thought that was a crazy number. The f at the end of the first month in Tunisia, 365,000 youngsters subscribed to an SMS-based service that taught them very basic skills. I think that is the, uh, that's what's interesting and, 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 and what's promising about social innovation along the lines of what Dina suggested. We are discovering as we do this the potential for our very young people to, to become innovative, to become entrepreneurial, and to bring about uh, changes to, uh, to, to solving real problems. Yeah. And, and they will do it, and these are private citizens. And I think there are people who are thinking very seriously about how to connect private citizens here with private citizens in the Middle East. Um, one of my closest friends, Tracy Avid, who is sitting right here, is putting together a program to connect girls here and girls in the Middle East. A very important initiative using sports that will build up skills, but will build up connections, and that will use technology to do it all. And this is what Chris's book is all about. Put technology in the hands of young people and see what will happen. So. OK, we'll take another round of questions. Hi, um, my name's Sasha Remed. I'm a MA in Arab Studies student at Georgetown. Um, so we've been, uh, thank you very much for a really great discussion. Um, so we've been talking very broadly about entrepreneurship, but um, I feel like on the one hand, you have the very micro entrepreneurs, and then um, uh, on the other hand, you have um, entrepreneurs who have um, maybe gone to universities overseas or you know graduates from AUC, AUB. Um, and it feels, it, it's just very, Broad. So I was just wondering, um, who do you think about and who are you talking about when you're discussing entrepreneurship and how do you, um, how do you ad address both groups and are they, do you kind of, do you really distinguish between both? So I want to know. Okay, uh, one more question and then we can answer. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Mariam Jamshidi. I'm the founder of a digital magazine on the Middle East called Mufta, and I recently wrote a book um, on the region as well, uh, on civic entrepreneurship in the region that is a nice compliment to Chris's book. So um, my question kind of relates to the question that came before me, as well as the question on civil society, um, as well as the question on informal markets. Um, so uh, there are a couple of gaps in this sort of entrepreneurship um, paradigm, right, that, that have been identified. One is the informal entrepreneurs. Um, the other one that I'm, I'm really con concerned about and wrote about in my book are entrepreneurs who um, are working in the, civic, in the civic spaces but aren't necessarily uh, bringing in um, a, an income stream. So you have organizations like in Syria, an organization called Suriali, which is a Syrian internet uh, radio station that is about developing a sense of civic responsibility among Syrians. They think of themselves as a startup, but they don't really have an income stream outside of donations. So my question is, how do we think about those entrepreneurs who aren't necessarily uh, 
going after the sort of small businesses or startups in a traditional sense, um, how do we incorporate them into this definition of entrepreneurship? A and should we incorporate them in this, in this definition of entrepreneurship? Great, great questions, Fadi. Uh, so most of the entrepreneurs in the region are not graduates of AUB or AUC, I mean, uh, or American universities. If you read Chris's book, uh, and you should read it. Uh, you'll find tens and tens of stories of people who graduate from universities that you've never heard of. Princess Sumaya University in Jordan, which is a which is a technology uh, uh, university, it graduates 400, 500 people a year. Each get uh, about an average of four job offers, four, four job offers per per graduate. So the question is why do these people get four jobs offers and are, are, are fully employed and are, if, if you go to uh, tech companies in the, in, the, in the GCC countries, you will find a lot of their uh, techies are graduates of this university and other technical universities in the region because they're teaching them the skills that the market requires. It's a very simple formula. And if you, if you have you heard of something called Code Academy? So Code Academy is based on the technology that was built by a young Jordanian graduate of Princess Sumaya University. He was nearly a dropout, took him six, seven years because he hated going to school, Amjad Masad. And Amjad uh, was, this, was a rebel, he, uh, a hacker, a troublemaker, and uh, they hated him at the university most of the time. His, his parents were always visiting the school because they're complaining about him. And then, because he's a rebel, he in, in, uh, engages in, in open source uh, software development and stuff like that. So he was publishing his, his, his coding uh, and his new discovery in, uh, uh, in, in how to program uh, over, over the web browser. Simple programming pro process. Uh, he discovered uh, that as he was publishing on open source, that he, that this company in New York called Code Academy was actually using his coding and his capabilities to build their startup. And then they find, and he kept every time, and then he was amazed. I mean, he didn't want anything in return. He said, look, these guys, these famous guys who have raised millions of dollars and Mayor Bloomberg is in love with them and talks about them are actually based on a guy that is a graduate of a Jordanian university. Eventually they brought him over and he became the chief, chief uh, software, uh, in, uh, you know, chief technology officer at, at the organization and now he's, he's a big guy at Facebook. But he's a graduate of the Princess Sumaya University in Jordan. You, you've never heard of it. But they are, these are the people that are going out. And there are, there are many people like him, by the way. We don't, we don't see them. There, 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 there is plenty of techies that work in these big companies. You know, the number three or number four guy at, at Twitter today is a Jordanian. You didn't know that, but he's, he's, he's hiding and doing things that he's doing. And, and so we're, uh, they're, they're out there. We, we read Chris's book. You will find a lot of these incredible stories. Or read Freddie's last article on LinkedIn. I wrote an article on, on, on Amjad Masad. You should read it, yes. Can I <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to make a, a point about that last question because I personally, and again, this may be controversial, this, this term social entrepreneurship I think has become quite loaded. And I personally have chosen to eliminate nonprofit organizations from social enterprises. For me, a social enterprise has to be profit making has to be a business with a, social impact. with a social impact. And I think there are very great, innovative, creative, amazing nonprofits out there that are supported by Ashoka, by Synergos, and I do not at all discredit them. Uh, but I think a part of the entrepreneurial spirit is really about um, systemic change that is scalable and that is profitable and that can create jobs and that can be expanded and that can eventually be sold to a much bigger player and make millions, and there's nothing wrong with that. So this is my own personal view on this. Other people have other views, but that would be my... But, but you know, all, all businesses have... Social impact. Uh, are, ...are come out to, 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 to solve a problem or, or fill a gap, and so, so we shouldn't... I mean, yes, it has to have social impact, and, but that's not socialist either. Yeah. It, it, it's just how you view things. So you, you make profit while you solve the problem, and that's the best, the best combination that, that you can have out there. Chris, you wanna, we're, we're, on, we're at closing time, so Chris, I'm going to let you say something uh, in this line of... 
discussion, and then Tarek, you'll close. I, I mean, I'd rather <laughs> just sit and listen to these guys, frankly, which is because that's where all the action really is. I just to go back and, and watch the twits, tweets, the Twitter on this, if you haven't been doing it already on your mobile device, because there's a lot of just amazing insight coming from around the world during this conference of, that's unbelievably hopeful and very optimistic and confirming many of the things that people here are saying overall. I would just say, in closing, particularly to the American young people here, and it's, it's very revealing even in some of your questions, the next five years is not going to be like the last five years. And I don't mean that in an obvious that life always changes in the future. What I mean is that the nature of the way people are solving problems and what they have in their hands to do it is unlike anything that's ever happened in the world ever before. And if you're doing anything in your university studies or in your think tanks or as journalists or in your businesses that aren't thinking about that first and foremost, you're going to miss, I think, one of the most important opportunities of mutual engagement that we've ever seen in our lives. And I would encourage you, particularly the young people here, to find out a go. Just find a way to go or find a way to build some kind of connection among the young people in the book or these folks can help you do it overall because people are just dying to do that. And you can hack the system. You can go around all the regulatory and pain the ass things we've talked about before just by simply doing. And that's where I would leave you. Thanks. But if we're doing closing remarks, I think, can I say something before it's taught it, Laila? Okay. I just wanted to take the opportunity to also thank um, Laila and the New America Foundation because this topic is not a topic that's discussed in this city. And I think this panel is a very rare occasion. So I think I, I really want to also take the opportunity to thank New America Foundation for allowing this topic to be written about and to also bringing in this exceptional group of people to sit and talk to everyone about it. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. This was, uh, and Silatak, you were largely behind this initiative. Thanks to GW. Um, the panelists have uh, really uh, inspired us, inspired me, I'm sure you. Um, and they have kindly agreed to hang around for a few minutes after. Um, if you have questions, they, you can feel free to approach. Um, Chris is available also to sign his book. Again, all the proceeds go to Ruad and the book is free. And the book is free. Just take one and leave. Nothing's free in Washington. Take one and leave. <laughs> you don't need my signature. Just read it. And th thank you all for very engaging questions. <laughs> Round of applause. Yes, yes, thank you.